in Philip K. Dick's novel, The Man in the High Castle, if we're looking for a traditional kind of hero, I think the person, the character that we would say comes closest to that is Juliana Frank for several reasons. And we can talk about her being a hero in terms of the plot, saving the day in a certain way, as we'll talk about in just a bit, but also in a certain sense as well, a metaphysical hero realizing something drastically important both through contemplation and through action about the very nature of the world that they're in, which we'll talk about elsewhere, I think. There's a great revelation that happens in the very final chapter. And so we meet her originally in the Rocky Mountain states which uh, she's moved to to get away from the Pacific states of America. She has become a judo instructor. And so the first scene that we actually glimpse her in, she is, um, you know, getting ready to take a shower. For months, she'd been living here in Carson City, Colorado. She was a judo instructor. Her workday had ended. She was preparing to take a shower. She felt tired. All the showers were in use by customers of Ray's gym, so she'd been standing, waiting outside in the coolness, enjoying the smell of mountain air, the quiet. And uh, she you know, goes on uh, there, and then we, we learn some things about her, right? Um, I learned this from the Japanese imbibed placid attitude towards mortality, along with money-making judo, how to kill, how to die. Yang and Yin, but that's behind now. This is Protestant land, the you know Christian land, you could say. And um, she's talking with one of the customers, Miss Davis, who says, um, "You know, you know, Miss Frank, I've gotten so much out of judo, even more out of Zen. I wanted to tell you." And then she asks uh, Juliana, um, "Did they hurt you much?" And she says, "Who?" the Japanese, before you learn to defend yourself. And Juliana says, it was dreadful. You've never been out there on the coast where they are. Uh, it could happen here, Juliana said. They might decide to occupy this region too. And then Juliana says, you never know what they're going to do. They hide their real thoughts. And Miss Davis says, what did they make you do? And Juliana says, everything. And uh, Miss Davis says, oh, God, I'd fight. And then Juliana walks away. So what are we learning from this? That while she lived in the Pacific States of America, she was raped by the Japanese. Um, it didn't turn her off from learning judo, which now she has as her livelihood. And we're also going to learn about her from her ex-husband. So there's a passage yet earlier in chapter one, the very end of it, where Frank Frank is missing his ex-wife and asking the oracle, will I ever see her again? So we get this great description. Juliana, the best looking woman he'd ever married, Soot black eyebrows and hair, trace amounts of Spanish blood distributed as pure color, even to her lips, her rubbery, soundless walk. She'd worn saddle shoes left over from high school. In fact, all her clothes had a dilapidated quality and the definite suggestion of being old and often washed. He and she had been broke so long that despite her look, she had to wear a cotton sweater, cloth zipper jacket, brown tweed skirt, and bobby socks. And she hated him in it because it made her look, she'd said, like a woman who played tennis or collected mushrooms in the woods. But above and beyond everything, he had originally been drawn by her screwball expression. For no reason, Juliana greeted strangers with a portentous nudnik Mona Lisa smile that hung them up between responses, whether to say hello or not. And she was so attractive that more often than not, they did say hello, whereupon Juliana just glided by. And uh, Frank, they were, we're getting her through Frank's eyes. At first he thought it was just bad, plain eyesight, but finally he decided it revealed a deep dyed, otherwise concealed stupidity at her core, which, you know, that's rather debatable. It might just be his point of view. And then a little bit later on in the work, we get uh, some thoughts on Frank's part again when he's trying to sell the, the jewelry. 
And he thinks, oh man, you know, if only we had Juliana here, then, um, you know, we could have her sell this. She, we could take pictures. She could go in and demonstrate it. And then there's some very interesting speculations. He thinks, I, I know she's living with some guy, sleeping with him, as if she was his wife. I know Juliana, she couldn't survive any other way. I know how she gets around nightfall when it gets cold and dark in everybody's home, sitting a lot around the living room. She was never made for a solitary life. Maybe the guy's a real nice guy, some shy student she picked up. She'd be a good woman for some young guy who never had the courage to approach a woman before. She's not hard or cynical. It would do him a lot of good. I hope to hell she's not with some older guy. That's what I couldn't stand. Some experienced mean guy with a toothpick sticking out, out of the mouth, side of his mouth, pushing her around. And then, you know, he's, he's thinking, I was too rough for her and I'm not so bad. There's a hell of a lot of guys worse than me. I could pretty much well figure out what she was thinking, what she wanted when she felt lonely or bad or depressed. I spent a lot of time worrying and fussing over her, but it wasn't enough. She, deserves, she deserved more. She deserves a lot, he thought. So we're getting a sketch. Uh, could be you know, accurate, could not. And this is a great segue into her hooking up with Joe, this, uh, at least on the surface, an Italian truck driver. And um, we get this uh, interesting encounter that's uh, taking place between the two of them. They actually uh, go home together and um, you know she's, she goes out and does some grocery shopping, comes back and he's still sleeping in bed. And she thinks, oh, the truck's gone. Did he miss it? Obviously. Did he intend to miss it? That's what I wonder. And then we get this interesting speculation. What a peculiar man. He'd been so active with her going on almost all night. And yet it had been as if he were not actually there doing it, but never being aware. Thoughts on something else, perhaps. And then she's musing more and she thinks maybe he's done it so much. It's second nature. His body makes the motion like mine now as I put these plates in silver in the back. And she wakes him up and they have some uh, talking back and forth. And he's, she's asking him about this tattoo. And he says, oh, that's from Cairo, where this great battle had taken place. So his, his past is part of what they're narrating as we go on. As, as we're going to find out, his past is partly what he presents to her, but it's also untrue in other aspects. And then he introduces her to this book, The Grasshopper Lies Heavy. Not in the sense of she didn't have any idea of what it is, but she hadn't read it. And he's talking about it and they have a lot of back and forth discussions that we've already discussed elsewhere about what's in the book. The point is he wants to get her involved in discussion and thinking about these matters of an alternate history so that he can get her into a sort of plot. And what we're going to find is something uh, quite interesting going on, an observation on her part. And we see her saying to herself, I wish I had never let him come with me. Now it's too late. I know I can't get rid of him. He's too strong. Something terrible is happening, she thought, coming out of him, and I seem to be helping it. And then there's a moment of maybe even like tenderness between them. What's the matter? He uh, uh, says to her, a mood, your problem, I'll analyze you free. You're scared of men, right? And she says, I don't know. And he says, it was possible to tell last night only because I took special care to notice your wants. And she says, because you've gone to bed with so many girls. That's what you started to say. And he says, but I know I'm right. Listen, I'll never hurt you, Juliana. On my mother's body, I give you my word. I'll be specially considerate. And if you want to make an issue out of my experience, I'll give you the advantage of that. You'll lose your jitters. I can relax you and improve you in not much time either. You've just had bad luck. She nodded, cheered a bit, but she still felt cold and sad. And she didn't know why. So she's got a kind of sense about this guy who's now her lover. 
And they decide they're going to take off and drive to Denver, the big city, and enjoy themselves together for a bit. He's got a, a nice supply of money. And what we find out happening, it's interesting too, because it's going to come up in the form of letting Juliana think that it's her idea. So um, they talk about the book again. They drive on quite a bit. And then um, Joe says, you take to that grasshopper book so much. I wonder, do you suppose a man who writes a bestseller and an author like that, Abinson, do people write letters to him? I bet a, lots of people praise his book by letters to him, maybe even visit. All at once, she understood. Joe, it's only another hundred miles. His eyes shone, he smiled at her, happy again, no longer flushed or troubled. We could, she said, you drive so good, it'd be nothing to go on up there, would it? Slowly, Joe said, well, I doubt a famous man lets visitors drop in, probably so many of them. Why not try, Joe? She grabbed his shoulder, squeezed him excitedly. All he could do is send us away, please? With great deliberation, Joe said, well, when we've gone shopping and got new clothes all spruced up, that's important to make a good impression. Maybe even rent a new car up in Cheyenne, but you can do that. And so now they've actually got like a plan going. They're going to go to Denver, get themselves checked into the hotel, get some new clothes, get haircuts, and then actually go and drive another 100 miles to Cheyenne, nearby to Cheyenne, and uh, meet the author, Abinson, for Juliana. Not for Joe, but, you know, a way of him humoring her. So they do go shopping. And Dick actually describes in considerable detail through the eyes of Juliana what it is that they're getting. And she's quite interested in this. But there's another really important feature to this that I want to bring up that comes up several times in here. So she thinks to herself, um, she tells him, I hope we have fun in Denver. You need to relax. I want you to. And she thinks, if you don't, you're going to fly apart in a million pieces like a bursting spring. What happens to me then? How do I get back? And do I just leave you? I want the good time you promised me, she thought. I don't want to be cheated. I've been cheated too much in my life before by too many people, which would include even her husband, Frank, right? And so as they're deciding uh, what to do and uh, doing the shopping, uh, she says, let's eat dinner. Uh, well, he says, let's eat dinner. And then uh, she says, oh, I, I, we need to get a little bit of new stuff, pajamas. And uh, Juliana says, we'll go and register at the hotel. We'll change, we'll eat. And then she thinks to herself, it better be a really fine hotel or it's all off, even this late. We'll ask them at the hotel, what's the best place in Denver to eat? And the name of a good nightclub where we can see a once in a lifetime act. Not some local talent, but some big names from Europe. And she keeps looking at Joe, who has changed his hair. He's dyed it blonde, or actually, perhaps it already was blonde. And uh, she's thinking, with his hair short and blonde and his new clothes, he doesn't look like the same person. Do I like him better this way? It was hard to tell. So they check in, and then Joe is, decides for them that they're actually not going to stay in Denver. She says, are, are we going to stay one day or two? Do you think we could stay three? And he says, we're going on tonight, going on to Cheyenne to meet up with Abinson. At first she did not understand. When she did, she could not believe him. He says, after we eat. So wear that blue dress that costs so much, the one you like, the really good one. And she says, it's too late tonight. And she says, no, no. We'll be through dinner around 5.36 at the latest. We can get up to Cheyenne in two, two and a half hours. That's only 8.30, say nine at the latest. Tears began to surge up into her eyes and she found herself doubling up her fists with the thumbs inside as she'd done as a child. She felt her jaw wobble and when she spoke, her voice could hardly be heard. I don't want to go and see him tonight. I'm not going. I don't want to at all, even tomorrow. I just want to see the sights here like you promised me. 
And as she spoke, the dread once more reappeared and settled on her chest, the peculiar blind panic that had scarcely gone away. Even in the brightest of moments with him, it rose to the top and commanded her. She felt it quivering in her face, shining out so that he could easily take note of it. And Joe actually tells her, put on the dress or I'll kill you. Closing her eyes, she began to giggle. My training, she thought it was true. After all, now we'll see. Can he kill me or can't I pinch a nerve in his back and cripple him for life? I know maybe you can throw me, Joe said, or maybe not. Not throw you, she said, maim you permanently. I actually can. I lived out on the West Coast. The Japs taught me up in Seattle. You go on to Cheyenne if you want to and leave me here. Don't try to force me. I'm scared of you and I'll try. I'll try to get you so bad if you come to me, right? And then there's this incident with the shirts. Joe has been presenting himself as, hey, I'm just this, you know, old, uh, well, not really old, 35-year-old uh, former Italian uh, soldier who fought in these, these wars. And then these, uh, you know, uniformed boy comes, uh, valet service, Joe uh, gathers up the new white shirts, carries them to the bellboy and says, can you get them out in half an hour? Just ironing the folds, yes, I'm sure they can. And Juliana says, how did you know a new white shirt can't be worn until it's pressed? And he says, well, you know, when I was younger, I used to dress up and go out a lot. And she starts to suspect everything. She says, did you really have your hair cut and dyed? I think your hair always was blonde and you were wearing a hairpiece. And then she says, you must be an SD man. You're supposed to come up here and kill Abinson, isn't that so? I, th I know it is, I guess I'm pretty dumb. And he says, well, actually you got it. I did fight in North Africa, but I was a Wehrmacht commando. I infiltrated British headquarters. And she says, you're not Italian, you're a German, Swiss. And so he says, we're going to go up there and we're going to fulfill this mission. And she starts to have a breakdown, a anxiety attack. And he su suggests that he'll give her some pills that will help her out. And she starts to spiral. So she has a sort of lapse into mental illness and he actually says oh you are in fact mentally ill uh you're very sick we can't go and he says i can't take you to the abinsons maybe we'll we'll go tomorrow so she goes into the bathroom and she gets out a razor blade and when she comes out she cuts him across the neck severing his carotid artery and he has to uh, keep himself alive by holding pressure on it and then uh, she goes out into the corridor naked the hairdresser says oh you're drunk get back in your room and then she gets herself dressed up she puts on her new coat closed her new handmade leather purse picked up her suitcase and as many of the parcels which were hers she could manage and she goes to the car and uh, before that says you know maybe i can tell them at the desk that you're dying um, don't look for me back at the apartment because I'm not going back there. I'm also taking your money. And what is she going to do? Well, she's going to go up and warn the Abinsons that the commandos from the Nazi regime are actually out there looking for them. So she calls the Abinsons and says, I've got to come up and see you. It's actually Mrs. Abinson who gets the phone. She says, the Oracle has told me to come and, and see you. And um, in the meantime, she actually finishes the book. And what we find is that there's so much more in the book than Joe understood. What is it Abinson wanted to say? Nothing about his make-believe world. Am I the only one who knows? I bet I am. Nobody else really understands Grasshopper but me. They just imagine that they do. Now, it may seem at that point that perhaps that's a reflection of her uh, mental derangement, insanity, lapse, whatever we want to call it. But as it turns out, she is the one who has the greatest insight into the nature of the book and even reality. And we'll finish up 
by, you know, she does get up there and warns Abinson. Um, and and uh, the Abinsons are not happy with her. And then Hawthorne Abinson says, do you know what you are? This girl is a daimon, a little chthonic spirit that roams tirelessly over the face of the earth. She's doing what's instinctive to her, simply expressing her being. She didn't mean to show up here and do harm. It simply happened to her, just as weather happens to us. And there's an important revelation, not just that the SD people are trying to kill Abinson, but something about the nature of reality itself in their world. So this tells us an awful lot of great interest about this character, Juliana Frank, who again, if there is a hero or heroine to this, she probably has the best claim to be that particular person. 